Hi, I'm Bill Hodges, and this is Spotlight on Government. And we have with us today Florida District 63 House of Representatives, Mark Danish. Hi. Glad to have you with us, Mark. I'm glad to be here. Your son, Mike, gave me a great glowing report on you and said <laughs> you were really a great guy, and now it's up to you to prove it. <laughs> uh, <yeah>. I hope <laughs> I can prove him correct. He sure is very, high on his proud. dad. I have to give him that. He is really high. He's on Facebook with me. Oh. And he said, you know, you got to have my dad on the air. Yeah. So that's how it started. So you can blame him if you want. Okay. Well, I'm very proud of him. He's been very helpful to me. Pharmacist? Yes, he is a pharmacist and uh, he works in the area here. Let's talk a little bit about Mark, though. <laughs> Mark, why would you, this is your first year in the House, correct? Correct. Why would you leave such a comfortable position as being a teacher <laughs> and add to that comfortable position the uncomfortable position of being a House of Representative member? Well, first of all, I guess being a teacher I don't think is the most comfortable thing to do. It's, it's a very difficult uh, profession. It's very difficult, hard working. You're, you're expected to work long hours. And uh, what happened with me getting into this was I'd seen how teachers have been treated over the years. And I've always been involved in trying to make it better for teachers and have people recognize that teachers are hardworking people and are doing the best we can and it's a very good, noble profession. Uh, and so I ended up where previously I was helping other people get elected. I saw an opportunity to get involved and I decided to throw my hat in the ring, I guess as they would say, and run for office. And it was a difficult road, but uh, I was successful so at doing it. So it wasn't insanity at all. It was the same thing on your part. <laughs> I don't know. I guess some people might question that. I, I, I hope it was the same thing to do. I, I feel very good about it. I think the outcome has been very positive for me. Well, with, um, with 31 years in the classroom, you've handled a lot of animals along the way. It, so it, the legislature isn't too much different. Right. That was one of the things I found. Everyone told me, oh, when you get up to Tallahassee, especially you get into the last two weeks, it's very, very hectic up here, and it's hard to get a good grasp on what's going on. And at the end, I went, hold it. This wasn't that difficult. <laughs> you know, they're saying, you know, you can have 12-hour days. and 12-hour 12, 12 days, that's normal for a teacher. You have 35 kids in a classroom. Hey, what's a few more out there in a representative setting? Exactly. It was, uh, it was sort of like a normal day for me to deal with that hecticness there of the legislature and you know those who can keep their the wits about them uh, come out of there and by the time it was over I was like saying hey I'm ready for more. So tell us you got elected the hard part probably was getting elected to start with now you think okay I'm ready to go how do they break a new state representative in? How, what kind of instruction do you get is there a man, manual they hand you and say, these are the plays? What do you do once you've been elected? Well, that was kind of interesting, is that you have your caucus, and luckily I had some representatives with experience uh, that all kind of have a little lessons for you, and they go over it, some of it in groups, some of it individually, and help you understand how the process works. Because it's one thing to learn about the process from the outside, but once you're inside and you're involved with the people, then it, there's all these little things you have to learn and how to run your office, how to work your bills, how to do all of the fine parts of it, you know, getting down to the details of, of it. And so there's a lot of people who will give you advice and you become good friends with those people and they kind of mentor you along. And one thing I was told by uh, Representative Janet Cruz, she said, uh, just play it forward. She says, when you've been here a while, you train the new people coming up also and show them the rope so that they don't just walk in there and get caught like deer in headlights, that they know <laughs> exactly what to do and how to react. And, you know, the first couple of days I was a little nervous being up there, but very quickly I picked up how to do things and after I would speak on the chamber floor, they would tell me, okay, here's what you did and here's how you can improve it. And within about two times speaking, I felt very comfortable speaking in committee as well as uh, on the House floor and uh, became very good at it, I felt, and uh, did not become nervous about it anymore. Again, your teacher training plays into that because you've been giving lectures for the longest period of time, 31 years. 
I think teaching helped me a lot because I'm used to talking, of course it's with kids and here it was with adults and that first time you look around and you realize there's <laughs> 120 people that you're talking to and there's a gallery of people and it's like, wow, this is a lot of people, but you become comfortable with it and I think my teaching experience helped me get very comfortable with it and I became a strong spokesperson and ended up speaking on a lot of different topics and uh, by the end I was a frequent person to speak on topics and uh, tell how I felt about it and how the people in my district feel about things. Because I'm up there representing them and I feel I'm not there just to sit and watch what's going on but to speak up for the people of my community. Your staff here doubles up there, correct? Yes. You don't have a separate staff up in Tallahassee. Right, the way it works is you have two people on the staff. You have a legislative aide and that person is in Tampa when you're in Tampa and is in Tallahassee when you're in Tallahassee and then there's the district secretary or district aide and that person stays in Tampa the whole time. Brian does a great job. Yes he does, he's handling things real well, keeps me going where I need to Very go. Very constituent oriented. And yes, that was one of the things we said we wanted to be was very much taking care of the constituents in the area. If they have questions, help them, guide them where they need to go and what can be done. And he's been very good at handling that and, and covering those things and then coming to me with all the situations and, and getting my ideas on it and uh, getting in touch with people when I needed to talk with them directly and when it was just, hey, they need to go here, he could handle that and save the bigger ones for me to talk with the people about as well. Did you inherit the staff? Were they already staff members? in some other office? No, I had to hire my own staff and so I went about you know having some interviews and talking to some people and uh, bringing Did either of your staff members have previous legislative experience? Uh, yes, uh, my legislative aide uh, has been, uh, matter of fact, uh, she's gonna hate me to say this, but uh, she is the youngest uh, LA in the House of Representatives. Really? And uh, she's very experienced. Uh, from what I understood, she started there when she was 15 years old. My goodness, 15 she, years old. Yes, she started working there from high the school. Page or something. All, all different jobs. She's worked in the uh, trying to get all the different things that she's done. She's worked for different representatives. She worked in the Attorney General's office oh. and the Sergeant of Arms office over in the Senate side. So she's become very familiar with how the whole process works. Where all the bodies are buried. Yeah, so to speak, <laughs> yes, and uh, in, a, in a good way, not in the yeah, bad way. Right. She knows, I'll, I'll mention something, I said, you know, I need to get with someone on this, and she goes, I know just the person, I know this person. Wow, and that's she'll a quickly real give help a call to a freshman and, walking in there. Yeah, I felt like a freshman walking in there and being able to get quickly in contact with the right people. It, it really helps, and they say the your legislative aid can make or break you when you're up there. If the person is a good person who knows the people, you get in contact, you're not wasting a lot of time chasing people, you're getting directly to them so you can speak with them and get things accomplished. I find the same thing, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, when I deal with the representatives' offices, if they have a good legislative aid, I don't have any trouble getting them on the program. There are others that are just too busy or can't do it or can't put it together. And of course, your staff were just very, very helpful. Brian does a good job, and, and Jen does too, and I'm, I'm very proud of the two of them and the great job they've been doing. You know, Brian's also a new person to this. You know, he's done other kind of work that relates to it, and he understands politics real well and understands what the needs are. In but he cares office. about people, and that's what I'm getting from him as I call and I talk to him on the air or on the phone. He, he cares about people, constituent oriented, I guess is the thing. All right, you're up there now, your first few days, what do they do? Well, first of all, we get started before the session begins, you're up there for committee weeks, where you go into your committees and you start learning things about uh, the different committees that you're on. And uh, I felt as a freshman, I ended up with a good draw of committees because you, know, you request what committees you want to be on, but they're selected for you and you're told what committees you'll be serving on. And of course, I served on the education committee, well, that's a no-brainer. Uh, that was an easy one. <laughs> also, because I, I said I wanted to have diversity. I don't want to be pigeonholed as just a teacher because I'm involved in a lot of other things. My degree is in Earth and Environmental Sciences, so I ended up on the uh, Appropriations Committee for Agriculture and oh. uh, Environmental Affairs, as well as I was on Appropriations Committee for Government Ops, and I was also on the Economic Affairs Committee. 
So I was kind of spread out, and then when it came time for conference, which is much later in the legislature, when you're ironing out the difference between the Senate and the House budget, I was picked to be on the judicial conference, which put me in another new field. Well, that's interesting. I can see the relationship in the first one. The, the last one was a little bit of a stretch. It was. It was uh, sort of out of the field for me, and uh, I very quickly, once I found out I was going to be on that committee, the conference committee, I quickly uh, studied up on it. I spent the next 24 hours reading everything about their budget, <laughs> because usually <laughs> as you go through the committees and through the session, you learn everything about the budget that you're on, like I did with two other budgets. So I just figured, okay, get all the information together and uh, go over line by line their entire budget. So by the time conferences started, I knew everything about a third budget. Now, interestingly enough, who assigned you to these? Uh, I know the suggestions come from, you know, my, my leader, the minority leader, but the, the final decision is uh, with Speaker Will Weatherford. He makes the final decision. Even though you're a Democrat? Right. He's in charge of everything that goes on in the House of Representatives. So he still gets to place the Democrats where he wants them? Yes. He gets the final say on that's everything. That's interesting. I, you know, that's one thing I didn't realize. I thought that the minority leader would place his people his positions where he wanted them. I didn't realize that the majority leader actually would step across the, across the line and put the people in different places. Well, uh, Leader Thurston does turn into the speaker. His suggestion is what he wants. And a lot of times, I don't know how much of it happens because you know, I don't see the final thing on that, but a lot of it we get the way he wants it, right. but the final say does belong with the speaker. Well, I learned something today, and that's a good day. <laughs> You're a good teacher. Oh, um, thank you. When you go up there, what happens now? Do they have classes for you? Are there sessions where you go to class to start with before you actually start the sessions? Actually, there are a few meetings that you have, and some are required on ethics. You have to go into an ethics class where they go over everything that you need to know as a representative, and then they give you a manual which tells you a lot of the information and you get some booklets so there's a little bit and then your caucus meets and goes over here's what you can expect is going to happen having just gone through the ethics what are the ethics requirements what are some of the things that stand out in your mind now, there's many things i'm sure and we only have a 30 minute show but what are some of the things that your ethics bound not to or to do well, I guess the key one is that once the session begins, anything dealing with the political end of campaigning, fundraising, all of that is at a total halt. I think that's one of the biggest things, is that you have to be aware of that, that you cannot talk anything about that, and also that you learn that any of that cannot happen when you're on the Capitol. So when you're in the public area, none of that can happen. You can really? talk to lobbyists, but it must strictly be... The lobbyist be, comes up to you and says, we want to support you, we're willing to put up $30,000, blah, blah, blah. You can't talk about it up there? I would have to say, you'll have to talk to me that later on after session. But huh. they know also the ethics, so okay. they won't... So they're not going to do that, that to yeah, start with? Okay. They will not do that also to okay. start with. They'll save it for after session for anything like that. And uh, strictly come in and say, hey, let's go over the bills. So it's very work-related to the bills that are going on. What about on. buying lunches, dinners, parties, things of that nature? Okay, that's part of the ethics also. They can't, lobbyists can't buy you any kind of dinner unless it's something that's open to the general public is invited as well. So you have to be very careful and say, you know, if you're invited out to, to eat, you have to say, I've, I'll pick up my own tab. Gee, that used to be one of the great perks. <laughs> It was, but they felt that that was too much of an influence on people. Of course, I don't think, you know, buying a cup of coffee is, but even that, they can't even, you know, give you a cup of coffee. You, you have to take care of everything yourself. I, I was in military marketing, and we had to do, follow, follow a lot of those same rules. And it got to be a point where it got silly in points, where a cup of coffee, if, if they really think a cup of coffee is going to buy you, then somebody made a mistake electing you. I think there's to be some good sense put into the middle of it. That's true, and that's one of the things they've been looking at is, you know, should they change how that's done, that, you know, if you go over and, you know, you have a cup of coffee with someone, that that wouldn't be a problem, that there was talk about if it's under, you know, $25. That it yeah, Tom Lee did a really good job when he was in there in the Senate the first time. Right, he helped set that up. Some things set up, but, but I always felt it was just, you know, a little extreme. We had people come into our plant 
from the government and we would all go to dinner at the cafeteria in the plant and there was no place for us to pay. And they would have to send us checks. Right. That's... Which cost us much more than the lunch did to even process. So there's got to be some, and I think there's a difference between yourself and staff too. What would move you maybe wouldn't move, or what would move them might not move you. So ethics is an interesting subject. But it makes it good in ways that, you know, we draw a line and we know then that there's nothing that, you know, is okay. Everything is considered, you know, off limits. And so you just go with that premise. In, in Ohio, again, going back, I managed a lot of various campaigns in Ohio in the Senate and the House both. And every Ohio State football game, they had these tailgate parties. And if you had your little pin like you're wearing on, you got into them and everything was free. That doesn't happen anymore? No, no, you cannot do that. Oh. If, you're, if you're doing anything, then you need to pay. Well, I don't want to run that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's part of what you, know, you have to understand on it. What are some of the other things that happened to you as a freshman? I rarely get a chance to talk to somebody <laughs> their first time up there. It, it, it's very exciting. I, I found that the whole process was very interesting. And uh, I very quickly got into it. I got into the long days of working it and uh, looking over bills. And it was very exciting. And uh, seeing things, and you know, there were things that I could be for, and then there were things I had to fight against. Because uh, it's a mixed bag. There are things that are good that are happening there, and then there are things that uh, I wasn't so favorable about. So I looked at some of the accomplishments, though, that happened up there, and I think it was a good legislature for that. Uh, we did get some really big things done. And I felt good because one of the things I told the people, my constituents, that I wanted to work on was to change education with the diplomas we have for high school. That, you know, right now it's just an academic diploma because it, you know, that everyone's going to go to college. But what happens to those kids who are not going to be able to go to college? That we need to have uh, a different type of diploma, a vocational diploma. And that was one of the things that came out of the Education Committee was a vocational diploma, and we're now moving forward with that. How would that work? I, I, I tend to agree with you, because not everybody should go to college. Well, the vocational diploma, they're still going to have to work on the details, but what it's going to consist of is getting your core classes in and then working either an apprenticeship or with something in business to be able to lead towards a job, a good paying job. I mean, uh, one of the things I quickly learned when I was there in my Economic Affairs Committee was there's 100,000 jobs in the state of Florida right now that are going unfilled. Here we have really? un high unemployment, yet there's 100,000 jobs where there are no people trained to do those jobs. And that's one of the things that, that in education we want to start moving towards is getting these people to work towards something that they can do for an actual job that pays well. And then when they finish high school and they have that vocational diploma, they can go to a two-year college and get further training and get either a certificate or whatever's required in the proper training in order to pick up one of these high-paying jobs. I have a grandson who went to a vocational school. He went to a regular high school, but then they put him over to one of the vocational schools and he majored in robotics. And he got his degree or got his diploma from high school, now he's going on to that secondary school to learn more about robotics. And it's a wonderful thing. And that is exactly what we're looking to do, is to get people who may not be moving forward with, you know, their education is going to be their main part of what they want to do in life and go on to college and, and so on. But what also happens with the vocational degree is now they're going into a job but as they finish that two-year degree, it will enable them to move on and get a further education. And maybe once they have that vocational training and see what kind of job they have, they'll go on and get that four-year degree or well, beyond. I, I love our vocational schools that we have here in Hillsborough County. I think they're absolutely fantastic. The South Shore one or South County one is absolutely, I've been there any number of times. If you've never visited one of those campuses, you, and you care about kids at all, you really ought to call the principal and say, look, could we come in for a visit? Because they're phenomenal. And that's what's great, is that we have these good schools, and now we're going to start to expand it. 
and make it more available, not just to a few students, but many more students. And now it's going to take a few years. It isn't going to be the kind of thing where, you know, next year all of a sudden there's going to be change. It's one of those things that's going to be a slow change over a couple of years as we grow into this. I would think that some people would feel, well, this diploma is not as good as that one. But they have to be educated to the fact that they're, they're equally good, they're just different. That's exactly it. They're equal but different. And it, it's, it, it's, it's serving what the people need. These kids, not every kid is the same. We can't have a cookie cutter and say every child is going to learn in this way, every child's going to be able to go in this direction. You have to make it so that kids can go in whatever direction they need and give them a diversity of learning situations that will actually, I think, mean in the long run more kids graduate. Because before, if you couldn't do it, then you drop out. And that's the wrong way to do things. I think our graduation rates are going to go up and I think more kids are going to end up in college in the long run. Well, again, not all of them have to be there. We want to be careful. We don't send them off to colleges and waste a lot of money because colleges, that's the next bubble in my mind. And that's something I'd love to see the legislature really tackle is the bubble that I see in education. Education is rising 8 and 10 and 12 percent higher than the, than the rate of our, of our inflation. We haven't had much inflation. But the education rate, you look at these universities and they're raising their rates every year. And that's got to stop. That's correct. And we also want to make sure that people get their money's worth in their education. And that's why nowadays we want people to look at when you go into college, not just to get a degree to get a degree, but with the outcome of how can I get a job? What kind of job am I training for? And that's what the vocational end of this is going to do, is more people will be looking at what the end product is going to be. What is the outcome? And of course, college graduation rates are not high enough. So we have to make sure we're getting the outcome. And this is one way where students will go in with a job at the end. And I think that's going to encourage more people to do it when they realize, hold it, when I finish this two-year college, I have a job waiting for me that I can start on. I think that's going to change how people look at colleges. What are some of the kinds of jobs that are out there that don't have enough people for them? Can you think of any right off the top of your head? Well, right away what I think of being in Tampa Bay, because I've heard from the people in the port of Tampa, and they say there's a lot of jobs there, that most of the workers there are 50 years and older. They have very few young people coming in, everything from crane operators to other personnel that have to work you know, in the heavy shipping industry, and that? Heavy, a lot of heavy equipment jobs, running cranes, things like that, which take a lot of training. You can't mm. just, you know, grab a crane and start to do it. You have to be trained, and some of those things take two years of training. I was watching them down the Manatee, Port Manatee, unload the, the ships with the produce coming in for Dole, and it, it's really fascinating to watch the guy up there in the crane going back and forth. And well, It's almost like watching somebody in one of those arcade games picking stuff up, <laughs> I'd drop it all over. It's a very exact type of work and, and someone has to be trained at great length in order to be able to do that. And again, good paying job and you don't have to be you know, a rocket scientist to do it. You can we've get the a, right training. We've got about five minutes left and I wanna be sure okay. that you get across all the things to your constituents that you wanna get across. Would you like to take a minute and thank the people that helped you get elected and promise the other ones that didn't vote for you that you'll still work for them too. Okay, yes, I want to thank everyone who's helped me get elected and uh, to serve, and now I'm here to serve the people, all of the people, and whether you voted for me or not, and uh, I want to do the best job I can, and that's one of the reasons I like to outreach as well, and people can call my office and uh, let me know how they feel about things, and I hope to uh, be able to help all the people in the district. That, that's part of what I'm trying to do. And so I'm working on some things. Matter of fact, right now, uh, I'm going to be working on a bill I tried to get passed in the last session, which is a Hillsborough County ordinance, uh, which is going to help disabled people uh, get gas pumped at uh, the gas stations. And there's different rules around the state, and I want to have it where it's just one set way, which is based on what we do in Hillsborough County. What do we do in Hillsborough County that's different than the rest of the state? Uh, they have little uh, notices on the uh, pumps, which have you call the uh, gas station, and if there's the personnel available, two or more people there, okay. that they'll come out and pump the gas if you're disabled. 
Oh, and can't yeah, pump the gas yourself. I don't think a lot of people even, well, maybe if you're disabled, you know that. It's the kind of thing, if you're disabled, they know about it. And uh, it's been very helpful. I've even heard people coming from other areas surrounding Cal, like Pasco, will come into Tampa to get their gas whenever they come through the area because they know they can get assistance when they're by themselves. And that's just in the county. It's not a state law. And no, it's not sound, a state law. That's what I want to make Sounds reasonable if there are two or more and they can spare someone to do it. And that, that's what I'm going to try to do is one of the things. I've been having some uh, discussion with uh, the Commissioner of Education, Bennett, Tony Bennett, and uh, I've talked to him about Common Core. Of course, that's the big thing coming in education. And uh, I've had some discussion with him. I've done a little bit of teaching. Common com Curriculum? It's called Common Core, which is part of Common Curriculum. Okay. Uh, across the whole nation that's happening. And it's something that was started in each of the, in the states itself. Not, it isn't a federal mandate. It's something that came out of the states and how to bring this along and do it correctly because we're going to be hitting into it real soon and we don't want to you know overflow it but bring it on in a proper way and that that's going to be very important that we don't suddenly say the schools are not doing a good enough job because we're bringing something in quick instead of slowly and do it correctly and train the teachers because right now a lot of teachers haven't been trained on it yet but people resist change I guess that's always. They always resist change, and uh, a lot of people tend to feel threatened by change. And sometimes change is good, sometimes it isn't. Well, it, it's a lot like, and I think what you're talking about is makes a lot of sense when you say bring it in slowly. I don't know how many of you remember hearing the story about the frog in the bucket with water, and they just heated the bucket slowly, slowly, slowly. The frog didn't jump out. He sat there and boiled to death. And if we do it slowly enough, People won't even notice it's happening. Right, and it, it'll, it'll come along, and I think it'll be a big plus for education because it's getting people, instead of just taking these multiple choice type of tests and just trying to make facts, is get Common Core gets students to think about what they're writing about. It's teaching them the writing skills and making them think through things and take information, and it's more of a thinking part. How do you take a teacher, and I, I taught at the college level, and I, I didn't give a lot of essay tests because it took so long to grade them. But how do you get away from the multiple choice tests and the, these type of things and go to essay tests and do it with the same teaching staff you have now? Well, what's going to happen is you'll still have the multiple choice tests in there for regular testing, but we'll be bringing on a new aspect. of And a lot of courses, they already do that, where you look at what the kids write, but this is more of a set way of doing it and uh, it's going to be a process the teachers have to learn as well. And uh, there's a rubric that they have for how to grade it, and the teachers have to learn how to use that. And it's going to take time for them as well. It's a learning process for the teacher. I I've noticed a lot of kids, if you hand them a pencil, they have no idea what to do with it. Well, and a lot of it's probably going to end up on computers, too. We're, we're moving in more and more into the computer age, and I'm considering a bill about that as well, uh, this next session, that uh, right now, computer science is considered an elective. And it shouldn't be. <laughs> it should be a math class because that's where it's generating from. And right now, 11 states have adopted it as a core math class and counting as math. Not necessarily making a requirement, but in so many professions with new vocational training, computer training is going to be very important. So that's one of the things I'm looking at next is uh, making that part of the math curriculum. I, I have no idea how I'd run my business anymore. I'm a training and consultant. And I don't know how I'd run my business without a computer. We've gotten so far away from what it used to be to what it is now that computers are integral if you're going to be in business. You're correct. It's part of our lives. It's, it's an integral part, and everyone is using them. And if they're not using them, they're going to need to, to learn to use them, which I guess is harder for people who you know, weren't born into the computer age. I think kids actually have a big advantage on that because I know my granddaughter started working with a computer. She was three years old and she was yeah. working on a computer. One, one of our computers behind you is signaling to me right now <laughs> that we're running out of time. <laughs> Representative Danish, it's been great having you. District 63, I want to have you back. Will you come back and talk with us again? Definitely. I'm Bill Hodges, the Spotlight on Government. You're unique, you're special, you're great. Tell yourself so often because you are, you know, and we'll see you on the next Spotlight on Government. <laughs>